there is so much evidence for the proof of reincarnation that it is really mind-boggling. Reincarnation does not appear to give us any answers about the meaning of life, but certainly leaves us with many questions. To some people, the thought of reincarnation is comforting, but to others, it's as if existence is one huge treadmill that we cannot seem to get off of. We all like to believe that if you commit horrific sins in this life, you will be punished. And if you have been a good person, you will be rewarded. But there appears to be no evidence of this, and we are left none the wiser. The following are four more incredible reincarnation stories told by ordinary people leading ordinary lives. Number 4. John McConnell, United States John was a retired police officer who had been very close to his family and had frequently told his daughter Doreen, no matter what happens, I will always take care of you. In 1992, he worked as a security guard and one night after finishing his shift, stopped at an electronic store and saw two men robbing it and pulled out his gun. One of the thieves behind the counter shot at John and he was hit six times. The bullets had sliced through his left lung, his heart and the main artery. He later died. Five years after John died, Doreen gave birth to a son she called William. Unfortunately, William was born with serious heart and lung issues and had to undergo surgery. William was born with birth defects very similar to the fatal wounds suffered by his grandfather. When William was old enough, he began talking about his grandfather's life. When he was three years old, his mother was trying to work quietly in her study and William was misbehaving. She told him, behave or I will spank you. William replied, Mum, when you were a little girl and I was your daddy, you were naughty and I never hit you. Later, William began to talk more about the life of his grandfather and Doreen felt strangely comforted by the idea that her father had returned to take care of her just as he said he would. William then started to talk about his death in his last life and said that people were shooting during the incident. Another time, William said to his mother, When you were a little girl and I was your daddy, what was my cat's name? And she replied, You mean Maniac? No, not that one, the white one. Oh, you mean Boston, his mother said. Yeah, William said. I used to call him Boss, right? Well, that was correct. The family had two cats named Maniac and Boston and only her father referred to the white one as Boss. On another occasion, his mother asked William if he remembered anything about the time before he was born. He said that he died on a Thursday and went to heaven, and that he saw animals there, and also talked to God. He said, I told God I was ready to come back, and I got born on a Tuesday. Dorian was amazed as he had yet to learn about days of the week. Doreen started to notice other similarities between her father and William, where they both loved books. And when they visited William's grandmother, he would spend hours looking at books in his grandfather's study. And he even had his grandfather's mannerisms. William was also good at putting things together and could talk non-stop, just like his grandfather. But William especially reminded Doreen of her father when he tells her, Don't worry, Mum, I'll take care of you. William would often talk about the period between lives and told his mother, When you die, you don't go right to heaven, you go to different levels. He said that animals are reborn as well as humans and that animals he saw in heaven did not bite or scratch. Although Doreen's father had been a practicing Catholic, he believed in reincarnation and said that he would like to take care of animals in his next life. William said that when he grows up, he will be an animal doctor and will take care of large animals at a zoo. Number 3. Hanan Monsur, Lebanon 
Nam was born in Lebanon in the 1930s. When she was 20, she married Farouk Mansour, who came from a wealthy Lebanese family. The couple had two daughters named Leila and Galata. Shortly after having a second daughter, Hanan developed a heart problem and her doctors advised her not to have any more children. However, she did not heed the doctor's warning and had a third child, a son, in 1962. In 1963, Hanan's health started to deteriorate and she started to talk about dying. Hanan's husband, Farouk, said that Hanan told them that she was going to be reincarnated. This was two years before her death. When she was 36, Hanan travelled to Richmond, Virginia to have heart surgery. She tried to telephone her daughter, Leela, before the operation, but couldn't get through. Hanan died of complications the day after surgery. Ten days after Hanan died, a child called Suzanne Ghanem was born. Suzanne's mother told Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist from the University of Virginia and an authority on reincarnation, that shortly before Suzanne's birth, she dreamed she was going to have a baby girl. She said that she'd met a woman and we kissed and hugged. She said the woman was about 40 and said, I am going to come to you. Later, when she saw Hanan's picture, she thought it looked identical to the woman in her dream. Suzanne's mother went on to give birth to a baby girl. One day when Suzanne was only 18 months of age, she picked up the phone and said over and over, Hello Leela, hello Leela, again and again. The family had no idea who Leela was. As Suzanne got older, she was able to explain that Leela was one of her children in her previous life, and she was not Suzanne, but Hanan. The family asked, Who is Hanan? Suzanne replied, I am still too young, but when I am older, I will tell you. As she got older, she was able to name her children in her previous life and the name of her husband, Farouk. She was also able to name her parents, her brothers, and even 13 names of her relatives in that previous life. Suzanne's parents decided to try and locate their daughter's past life family. Inquiries were then made in the town where the Monsors lived. However, word had got around where the Monsors had heard about the case and decided to visit Suzanne and her family. The Monsors were initially skeptical about the girl's claims, but became believers when Suzanne identified all of Hanan's relatives and accurately named them. Suzanne also told them that prior to her heart surgery, Hanan had given her jewels to her brother Hercule in Virginia, and that Hanan instructed her brother to divide the jewellery among her daughters. This was later verified. When Suzanne was five, she would call Farouk three times a day, and when her family visited the Mansours, Suzanne would sit on Farouk's lap and rest her head against his chest. Even when she was 25 years of age, Suzanne would still telephone Farouk. Number two, Kendra Carter, United States. Kendra lived in Florida, and when she was four years old, her mother took her to her first swimming lesson. When Kendra met her swimming instructor, she immediately jumped into the instructor's lap and started acting lovingly towards her. Kendra then developed a loving attachment to the swimming instructor named Ginger. The child then talked about Ginger all the time, and then began saying that she'd been a baby in Ginger's tummy. Kendra's mother eventually found out from Ginger that she'd had an abortion nine years before Kendra was born, when she was unmarried, sick, and dealing with anorexia. Kendra was usually a withdrawn child, but every time she saw Ginger, she was bubbly and happy. Time was set aside for them to be together, because Kendra's wish to be with Ginger had become very intense. Then her mother and Ginger had a falling out, and Kendra was unable to visit Ginger. Because of this, Kendra would not eat, slept a lot, and became depressed. After four months, Kendra was able to visit Ginger again, and she quickly recovered. 
Kendra's mother decided to buy a book about reincarnation to find out more about her daughter's strange behaviour. But she also felt uneasy and guilty about buying the book as it went against all of her beliefs of a conservative Christian church, which did not accept the idea that reincarnation was a natural process in life. It's strange that a child believed she had once lived before, though a very short life, yet her mother had no such beliefs due to her religious upbringing, so it is obvious that Kendra's belief was definitely not influenced by her mother. So where did Kendra get her beliefs from, as she appears to have been born with them? How did Kendra remember this past life with her previous mother when she had only existed in her womb for a couple of months before the abortion? Number 1. Diane Williams, Great Britain Diane's grandmother, Nanny Wyatt, died on the 4th of October, 1974, and for many years she mourned her passing. It was not until her third child was born on the 4th of May, 1975, that she started to come to terms with her grandmother's death. She called her child Kelly, and when she was two years old, was able to recall stories of her mother's childhood that left her totally stunned. One day, Diane's mother, Sister Pam, was visiting and picked up Kelly and placed her on her lap. Kelly then said, Do you remember when you used to sit on my lap like this? Diane and her auntie both laughed, believing it was just childhood fantasy. But then the child continued, saying, I used to comb your hair and described in detail the style that Pam had worn, which was a clear patra look of the early 1960s. Other than the hairstyle, where did Kelly learn the name Cleopatra? The two-year-old then went on to describe the type of dress that she had bought for Pam, which was white with red dots, which again was true. Now Diane and her auntie started to take notice at what Kelly was saying, as she was now describing things from the past that were totally accurate. Diane was now starting to notice her daughter's mannerisms which were identical to her great-grandmother's. When Kelly sat down in an armchair, she would place her child's handbag on the floor between the leg and the chaired leg, which was exactly as her great-grandmother would regularly do when visiting. As Kelly got older, she started describing in detail the types of Victorian clothing she'd worn in the past, even though she had never seen any pictures. Whenever she spoke about her great-grandmother, it was always in the first person, as if she is there herself, and used phrases that were now out of fashion. On another occasion, she described in detail the house she used to live in, along with the types of furniture. When Kelly's grandmother died, she comforted her mother, saying, It's okay, she is happy and with her family. She spoke with a maturity and a knowing for someone so young. One day an old friend of Diane's visited and were discussing what happened on a certain date when they were teenagers. Kelly then said, I know what year it was. It was when we had a plague of ladybirds. Her mother's friend was shocked, asking, How did she know about the plague of ladybirds? Then Kelly added that I can even describe what dresses you wore and then went on to describe the fashion that her mother wore as a teenager in the late 1950s. They then discussed the Falklands War, which was happening at that time, and Kelly again interrupted, saying, Yeah, it was the same during the last war when lots of bombs were dropped and Birmingham was hit really badly. Kelly was talking about World War II. Diane now believed that her daughter Kelly and her late grandmother Nanny Wyatt are the same person. At age seven, Kelly was very mature for her age and could easily converse with other adults. 